when we come together, we learn from each other. People come with different strengths and knowledge and understanding to enlighten us in things that probably we might not be fully aware of so that we can engage properly. And that's why we gather, uh, because we don't know everything and we don't have everything in one place. So there is the need for the people of God to come together, bring knowledge and experiences together so that we can be equipped for the battle that is ahead of us. So a scripture that the Lord gave us for this, and as I said, I'm just going to read that from Psalm 78, from verse 70 to 72. Psalm 78, verse 70 to 72. He said, he chose David, also his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the ewes, great with young. He brought him to feed Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hand. Amen. So God chose David for a purpose to feed his people. But before he chose David to feed people, he made David to feed the sheep. He fed sheep. He guided the sheep. He protected the sheep. In preparation for feeding human beings, guiding human beings into their destiny. Amen. So the 72 says, so he fed them according to the integrity of his heart. So he didn't just feed them, he fed them a certain way. He fed them from who he was. He didn't just feed them from his head knowledge, he fed them according to the integrity of his heart. So there was something that was coming out of him that was feeding the people. There was a heart position that David had that, that fed the people. So when he spoke, he spoke out of his heart. And whatever came out of his heart was like food to the people. Spiritual food was being released to the people of God because a man of God has been prepared by God and positioned his heart in such a way that when he begins to speak, it's like food dispenser. He's dispensing food anytime he speaks. But it didn't just happen. There was a process. And there was an experience in the wilderness that was deliberate to prepare him, to bring him to that position that he can feed a whole nation by the integrity of his heart. Not his family, a whole nation. He fed a whole nation from his heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So there is a, a preparation of the heart that God has to do amongst us if we are going to have impact in our world. And we must be willing to look after the sheep and be in hidden places that nobody sees us. And nobody says congratulations for what you are doing. Because nobody is going to congratulate you in the wilderness. There is no congratulations in the wilderness. Unless you want the sheep to begin to speak <laughs> to you. That's maybe the best you can get. You can get a mare for your good work. That's the best maybe you can get in the wilderness. Apart from that, you are not going to get anything. But you, are, you must prepare to stay there. Be engaged and be happy. And be content. And then at some point, God, when his work is done in your heart, he will move you from there and bring you to rule nations. Fed them from the integrity of his heart. So there is something in our heart that the world needs, but that thing must be well cooked so that when they eat, they don't vomit. So David fed them from the integrity of his heart. Not only that, he guided them by the skillfulness of his hand. So he wasn't just somebody who had good character. 
He wasn't somebody who just had good in integrity. He actually had skill as well. And you need a combination of these two things to be effective. Because you can have good character, which is good, but if you don't have skill, you might not be able to accomplish the purpose. So therefore, God had to engage him in certain things whilst he was there. So when he came to the children of Israel and Goliath was uh, taunting them and everybody was scared of him and he wanted to challenge Goliath, Saul said, don't even try, don't go there. He will tear you into pieces. He's been a man of war from his youth and you are just a youth. You won't stand a chance. And David said, whilst I was in the wilderness looking after my father's sheep, the lion came to attack the sheep. And I tore the lion into pieces. The bear came and I did the same. The Bible said that when Saul heard that, when King Saul heard that testimony, he changed his mind. He said, if what this boy is saying is true, then let me give him a chance. Uh, it's easier to tackle a, a, a human being than a lion. Don't you think so? At least a human being, he, he has two eyes. You also have two, two hands. At least, you know, there is some leveling there. But when it comes to a lion, it's a different subject. So, when he gave him that testimony, the king changed his mind. And he said, I will let the boy try. Because he has seen some stuff in the wilderness. And we all know the result. The skillfulness of his hand. What? With a sling. To hit a man on the forehead at that distance, it takes some skill. It takes great skill. That those days, there was no technology for precision weapons. There was no technology for precision weapons. This is skill that he has gained in the wilderness. And he talks about teaching my hands to fight and my fingers to war. These are things God taught him how to fight and to engage in battle. And God can teach us how to fight and to engage in battle. And it is that skill that he brought to the kingdom that made Israel a great nation conquered every enemy silenced everybody because of the integrity of his heart and the skillfulness of his hand so we need skill and that's why we have come to learn so that we can have the right information to engage in the battle that we are called to engage in so this afternoon, our pattern will be slightly different from what we do. Normally, we'll do a lengthy teaching before we go into it. But we believe that the subjects for today are so important, we want to devote the whole time to it. These are crucial subjects. You know, there are things I didn't think I will, I will see in my lifetime. I thought my grandchildren will see. But uh, it's happening in front of me. And I'm thinking, how, how did it change so quickly? Things are moving so fast. The speed is scary. And we need to be up to speed. Amen. So we've got great men and women of God that God has prepared for today to come and give us some insight. And I want you to prepare your heart to receive them. And I'm going to call my brother to come and introduce the first speaker. And uh, as she comes, I want you to receive that which she's bringing. And I believe it to be a blessing. So let's welcome my own brother from another mother. Pastor Ade Omoba. Bless you, my brother. Thank you. I'm particularly always um, 
impressed to introduce this speaker, and that's because she's, she's like a daughter to me, you know, and um, has a special, very special place uh, in my heart because from the day I met her and saw her, it's just that thing about her that is very inspirational. And she's one of those who had gone to our Wilberforce Academy. Um, I can't even remember what year she went now. And it's a few years back now. <laughs> she came to, yeah, six years? Yeah. She came to the Wilberforce Academy, like, um, from there, you know, God connected something to our heart, which was around being a voice um, for the baby in the womb. And ever since then, we stood alongside her to help. That's what God is calling you to. How can we encourage you, resource you the best we can so that she can go out there and do what God has laid on her heart. And ever since then, she's been on the news. She's been everywhere. She's been championing that cause. She's been to the different abortion places. She's going to talk to you. Um, she's been challenged at the same time. She's challenged as well. And she has a team. They go to places. They go and try and stop people from going into abortion clinics. And she's become a voice in her generation on the topic. And now speaking in different places, traveling and involved in documentaries. And that's one of the joys of what we like to do at Christian Concern. Like we kept saying, equipping the next generation of Christian um, speakers, um, leaders in public life. And so Ruth, for me, is one of those that, amongst others, that has taken that button and she's just running with it and doing it. So I'm so glad that she could be with us today. And so Ruth Rawlings, please let's welcome her. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Pastor Ade. Yeah, Wilberforce Academy. If you, um, any young people you haven't been, go. It's amazing. It will change your life. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I was just so blessed to, um, for Pastor Alex just to show me around the, the building earlier. And um, in, in this talk, as you can imagine, um, like the guys at Christian Concern, we, we go and speak so many different types of churches, different types of buildings, different types of backgrounds, so many different types of churches. But yeah, when I, came, when I came in, when I saw what you guys are doing, I, I was touched to tears. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, it's the Holy Spirit in me. Don't want to be crying right now. But um, yeah, it, I think it's so amazing what you're doing. And um, yeah, just to see the bed stacked up. Part, one of the major parts of, our, our, um, of my talk is normally the Good Samaritan and normally, you know, encouraging churches, pastors, um, Christians, to not be like the priest and the Levite who walked on by and, you know, left that, that man who was beat up on the side of the road. And I can already see that I can scrap that whole part of my talk because you guys are, are living it. You guys are, um, you are sacrificially, you know, I can see like even giving up your children's room to, to, to store beds and things like that. So I just want to honor you guys what you're doing is so, so, I'm so privileged to be here. And I just felt, yeah, the, the Lord say, you know, oh, just, just bring the unborn to them because these people are, are willing. These people are, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of them. And um, they are willing to stand for the vulnerable. They are willing to stand for those who don't have a voice. So I thought, well, my job is really just to ex expose what the situation is. And I trust that the Lord will um, um, encourage you to run with it in whatever way he leads you. So, without further ado, just myself, just to say a little bit about myself and my background, um, why this issue is so important to me. The Lord um, laid the issue on my heart, actually, while I was in, I was doing a year project at my church. I was volunteering at my church. And um, I saw on the, on the door of the church building, they used to rent out the building to um, council um, meetings and things like that and I saw a notice on the building and it said um, pregnancy decision making in meeting room three and as I walked into the church office I thought why is there a meeting about um, decisions in pregnancy what decision is there to make in pregnancy and I knew in my heart that they were talking about abortion and I was so grieved by this I thought how you know how can we rent out a room about where they're going, the, the council is going to be talking about, oh, how can we make decisions during pregnancy to have the baby, to not have the baby? 
And my heart was so grieved. And um, I just, that, I, guess I would say, was the time when the Lord really showed me his heart for the issue. He really broke my heart for the issue of the unborn. Because, and it was so tied up, not just the fact that this is happening, not just the fact that all these babies, his children, are being killed, but the fact is there's a blindness in the church to it. My, there's a blindness. My people are not aware, you know, we even read, we know my people die for lack of knowledge. And it's something, as all injustices are in history, they're, they're always being hidden. They're always out of sight. The victim is always dehumanized, but a bit more of that later. So I, yeah, that was the time. And then I got into a few years later. It took a while, as things, things do. But I got to go to the Wilberforce Academy, and that's where I met my, my now boss and got involved with the work, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about. And so, um, but m for myself also, I actually was raised in a Christian home, and my, I, I got pregnant, I, I went away from the Lord, and I got pregnant at the age of in my final year of university. I, I knew that was wrong, sex before marriage was wrong, but I wasn't following the Lord at the time, and I, but I knew that abortion was wrong, the fact that it didn't enter my head because my parents, although it hadn't been spoken of in my church, my, I just knew from my parents that it was wrong. I can remember a couple of instances, instances where my mother had cried, was so upset because a friend had had an abortion, and although I didn't really understand what the big deal was, you know, I, I, I knew from that and from another instance where she had prayed with another couple whose daughter had, had, had got pregnant and, then, and they had chosen life. So my, I'd seen my mum grieving over an abortion and also intervening and um, a, a life being saved who the family went on to love and the church went on to love. And so that, those, I would say those instances, because I didn't hear about it in my church in, in terms of from the pulpit, I didn't hear about the issue, but I knew it was wrong. So when I got pregnant, it just didn't enter my head. And I thank God, my parents were amazingly supportive. My daughter's now 14 and a blessing. <laughs> And, um, but then when I got into this work, I had a good friend um, called Laura, and we were very close. We, we prayed together. We, um, our, friend, our kids played together in the same church, and we were running a, a women's group, and we were about to go to LL Ministries for some healing retreat, and it was about the time I'd started volunteering with my organization, and I just said to her, um, Laura, I can't go to this healing retreat because I need to be at this conference. I've, and I told her how I got involved with my now ministry. And she said, Ruth, we need to talk. So bear in mind, we've been friends for eight years. And then we didn't have a chance to talk then. But when she spoke later, she went on to confess how she'd had an abortion about 10 years prior. And so that really opened my eyes to the level of secrecy in the church, those who have been in it. And we hear testimonies, you know, as, as the church of God, we're full of testimonies, right? about God's brought me from this to that. But, and I can't speak for every church, but for what I've seen a lot, the abortion testimony doesn't get a lot of, doesn't get a lot of um, airtime. Often it's shrouded in shame. Often it's shrouded in, um, we don't talk about it, it's taboo. And so right up front, I also want to say, you know, while this is a very sensitive subject as well, I'm aware in, in our nation, one in three women so the stats for men, we don't know what that is, have had an abortion in their lifetime. So I'm aware that, you know, we, may have, we all may have been involved somehow, whether it's asking, uh, advising a friend or whatever it is. So, yeah, this, I bring this message with love. I bring this message to say there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We can repent of all sins. Abortion is not the unforgivable sin. And so, yeah, just to say that right up front. Um, so yeah, so, so Laura, then she started to come and share her testimony with me. And I have seen her go from, you know, from total silence to a couple of weeks ago sharing her story on BBC in front of an abortion, abortionist. And yeah, it's just phenomenal how I've seen the, 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 the breaking of the silence and she is now allowing other people to go on and be healed and the, the, the big difference is what we talk about this a lot is, is that with her, everyone around her when she fell pregnant was saying, um, you can't do this, like your mom's gonna kill you. And even her mother said, um, she didn't tell her mom she was pregnant, but her mother may have suspected something and said, don't bring no illegitimate children into this family. 
And for her, she will say that sealed her abortion. And um, so it's, it's just very clear that this is not one woman's choice as the, as the media want to portray it to us. You know, this is, this is um, um, reproductive rights. This is empowerment for women. We know that, you know, as, as a body of Christ, we know that people don't make decisions in a vacuum. It's by the people around them, the wisdom of the people around them. Because I knew my parents, you know, whatever I had done wrong, I knew that killing a child was not, you know, was just not going to rectify the situation. And I knew that that would be more grievous to my parents than it would for uh, me to bring a child out of wedlock <laughs> into this world. And so, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that right up front. This is not, we meet people all the time, but maybe say, you know, oh, I'm, uh, I'm not going to get in that situation. I'm in my 60s and stuff like that. And it's like, well, no, you're part of a society. You're part of a community. And how you speak on this issue, how you teach your children, your nieces, your nephews, your church, is life and death to the people in our society. So I just wanted to say that right up front. So um, I'm going to quickly talk about, you know, how bad is the situation, first of all, in, in the nation? How bad is the situation of abortion? Then I want to talk to you a little bit about the history of social reform and how these other injustices in history, you know, whether it's the transatlantic slave trade, whether it's the Holocaust, you know, had they, they have been turned around and normally it's been Christians that have stood up. So I want to talk a little bit about that and then what we can learn and what we can do now. So I'm going to skip some of this because you guys don't need this. First of all, when does life begin? Scientifically, um, we know that every time a sperm and an ovum unite, a new being is created, which is alive and will continue to live unless its death is brought about some specific condition. From the point of conception, from the time that sperm and that egg meet, you are a whole new, unique, living human being. You have everything you need to grow for the rest of your life. It doesn't matter that it's, you know, one cell at that time, you know, and then it's, it's this big at, at eight weeks. It doesn't matter, you know, to, to, to God, when does life begin? It's not about, it's not about a emotional connection. We may see a, a newborn baby and be emotionally connected to it, we're, but we're not used to seeing children in the womb. Now, thank God for ultrasounds and things like that, we can now see this. But the, the, the fundamental thing is, is it a human being? Because, you know, we know before God, there's, there's no such thing as a kind of human being. You're either human made in his image or you're not human, you know, animal or whatever. You're either human being or you're not human. And I think society and sometimes even us, we, we complicate the matter. Because we, if, it's, if we complicate it, then, you know, we, we can be like, oh, you know, I'm not sure. And then we don't have to act. But science is very clear. Life begins from the point, point of conception. But what does the Bible say? Um, Jeremiah 1.5, even before conception, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. We know no matter the, the situation of your conception, whether it was in rape, whether it was in incest, whether it was the most horrific circumstances, that human being cannot have come unless for the breath of God, unless for the plans and purposes of God. And we know that's the message of the gospel of Jesus, that he takes, you know, what can be messy and horrible and he turns it around for his glory so sometimes the things that are taken from the most awful circumstances give god the most glory and no doubt we can think of stories um in that so we know psalm 139 i knit you together in my in my mother's womb my frame was not hidden from you when i was made in the secret place when i was woven together in the depths of the earth we, we know this we know this from the word of god oh sorry So yeah, but, so we know that it's a human being, but what does God say about, about abortion? I mean, the word abortion is obviously not in the, in the Bible because abortion is a euphemism for killing. And if, therefore, it is a human being, then every abortion ends, intentionally ends the life of an innocent human being. And we know that God hates hands that shed innocent blood. One of the Ten Commandments is do not murder. And we know throughout history in the Old Testament and, and you know, that God hated child sacrifice. It said he couldn't, it didn't even enter my mind. And in a, an abortion, a child's life is sacrificed for the sake of 
whether with a convenience, with a career, whether for other family members, reputation, fear, yeah? But sacrifice, that child is sacrificed and it's being dressed up to be some, you know, healthcare thing, some medical procedure. But really, what is the difference between that and in the Old Testament where they took their newborn babies and put them in the fire unto, unto bow for, so that they would get greater blessings? To God, there's no difference. So. Um, I want to show you a video now. Video, the power of video, the power of images. And I want to show you for yourself now uh, the beauty and the wonder of the Lord knitting together a child in the womb. We've got some amazing footage taken from the EHD, Endowment for Human Development. This has been shared all over the, the, by the National Geographic. So this is not, you can show this to children and you, know, it's, it's, you can show it even outside of the issue of abortion. This just shows the wonder and the humanity of the child in the womb. Sorry, I'm just trying to... Um, how do I make it play with this? Can you do it from... So just skip into the next slide. So hopefully um, he'll get that played. Yeah, there we go. The external ear is beginning to take shape. By six weeks, blood cell formation is underway in the liver, where lymphocytes are now present. This type of white blood cell is a key part of the developing immune system. Hiccups have been observed by seven weeks. Leg movements can now be seen. I'm just going to stop it there. Um, so, human being or bunch of cells? Yeah. And that image, that video says it all. I don't even need to describe it. Oh, gosh. Um, so, but what does the abortion lobby, what are they saying about this? You know, they, the, the Anne Faraday, who's the chief executive of BPAS, one of our biggest abortion providers, this is a quote from her. She says, for me, the question is not when does human life begin, because I think we can accept the embryo is a human life of sorts. For me, the question is, when does human life really begin to matter? So there you go. Where well, have we heard that before in history? Talking about we can make judgments on whose life matters and whose life doesn't matter. And obviously, we know in this, they're, they're saying that the woman can decide. Yet yeah, these are... 
you probably heard some of these um, slogans and stuff that the pro-choice. Can I just ask who's familiar with the term pro-choice? Have you guys heard of it? Okay, wonderful. So it really means that we think women should be able to have a choice to kill their offspring. That's what it means, but they drop the second half <laughs> of that because it might put people off the choice. And so they shroud it with euphemisms. My body, my choice. Um, reproductive health and all of this, they talk about everything. They talk about the woman, but they talk about everything but the child. Here is um, a description of the abortion procedure from one of the abortion clinic's websites. An abortion is the termination of a pregnancy. They don't even use the word fetus, then they're calling it a pregnancy, which doesn't even make sense. Up to 15 weeks, the pregnancy is removed by gentle suction with local anesthetic. Over 15 weeks, the pregnancy is removed via narrow forceps. It all sounds very clinical, very um, reputable, very gentle, but the reality is <laughs> it, it, this is ending the life of an innocent human being. And yeah, throughout history, it's always been um, these type of things have always been um, come across as if they're doing a great thing. And so even as uh, on my way here, I was just really thinking, I was praying for the body of Christ and just thinking about that phrase, my body, my choice. Like it is so rebellious against God. It is so idolatrous, you know, that it's, it's my body. And I don't know if you've ever seen any of these extreme feminist types that are really pushing. Like many of the people who... who who have abortions, you know, they're not even this minded. Of many of them, they're caught in the middle, they're ignorant and stuff like that. But those that are really pushing for abortion, you can literally see, um, you can literally see demons manifesting sometimes. It's literally, it's like, my body, my choice. When we've been out, and I'll tell you a bit more about what we do, they chant, they love to chant. And they say it, if they say it as, as, as many times as they can, it becomes you know, like true. So they're chanting, my body, my choice. Not the church, not the state. Women will decide their fate. They're chanting, 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 chanting. And you just look at them and they're so lost and they're so overcome by, by this idolatrous um, rebellion that, you know, my body is mine. No one, you know, and it's the woman's body. No one, all men, shut up. You know, it's so demonic and so against God's natural order of it. And I was just thinking about, you know, my body. That's what, we are the body of Christ. You know, we were bought at a price. He paid, he paid the price. He sacrificed himself. And that's the most loving thing he could do, that anyone can do, is to lay down your life for your friends. And he sacrificed himself that we may go free. And abortion is the exact opposite of that. It's, you know, I'll sacrifice my child that I will be free. And it's demonic and it's from the pit of hell. And I want us to understand this. And it's not that the, the woman going into the abortion clinic thinks, oh yeah, I'm going to go and sacrifice my child to Baal. No, she doesn't think that. She's caught in lack of knowledge. She's caught in everyone around her pressuring her. She's caught by the, the prophets of Baal are preaching this message. And she's been caught in the middle of it, as have many of the men. So that's why it's so important that we as the body of Christ... We need to speak so clearly on this issue because if we're silent, then people, our congregation can default to the, to the ways of the world. So I just wanted to highlight that. And now what I want to show you is, once again, there's another video coming up. Um, this video is what, what we've done. There was an infomercial of Mary Stopes, one of the abortion clinics, abortion providers, and they've done an advert on what a woman can expect when she comes to get an abortion. And um, they show her coming in and, you know, greeted by, by great people. The problem is, is when it gets to the abortion procedure, they cat to black. And then we see her coming out. So it's meant to be, in, you know, informing people about, the abortion, about abortion, what they can expect, except it shows nothing. So we've taken that infomercial. Everything's the same, apart from when it cuts to black. We've inserted the abortion procedure in there so that people can see for themselves. And so there's no sound. It is graphic, it is horrific. God has to see this 800 times every working day. So I think as his body here, you don't have to look if you don't want to, I won't pressurize anyone to look, but I think as his body, as his representatives here on earth, we should know what's going on. And um, it's this kind of imagery that has mobilized many of us to 
to um, get into this work to advocate for the unborn child. So without further ado, I'm going to show you this video. If it will play. William Wilberforce um, closed one of his speeches at Parliament and said, you can choose to look the other way, but you can never again say you did not know. And now we've seen with our eyes what's happening, as horrific as it is, the question is, you know, what are we going to do? What can we do for these brothers and sisters of ours, for our neighbours, for our unborn neighbours who are every bit human as us, just slightly undeveloped, just like a newborn baby is less developed than a 15-year-old, just like a 15-year-old is less developed than a 50-year-old. It doesn't make us any less valuable or any less worthy in God's eyes. And so how, you know, how bad, how often is this happening in our nation? Um, just give you some stats. About 56 million abortions every year. Let's put that into context. Approximately 11 million died in the Holocaust. We look back at the Holocaust as an outrage, 56 million every year, repetitively, of the unborn child. In Great Britain, more than 200,000 abortions each year, about 800 every working day, one in five babies are aborted, and over 9 million abortions have taken place since the 1967 Abortion Act, so in 50 years in this nation, um, 9 million abortions and I just I, I just wanted to get the Haringey stats as well for you guys to put it into context here I got that right Haringey right <laughs> good um, so I looked into the homicide rate from and I, I could only find 2015 so apologies um, there were seven homicides so that is um, murder and manslaughter included in Haringey in 2015 tragedy seven lives lost every life lost is a tragedy and you know we do hear outrage about about some of this 
However, 1,509 unborn children in Haringey were killed. Of, this, is, this is women who are resident in Haringey. So they may have had their abortions in other, in other places, but they're, they're resident in Haringey. So that's citizens of Haringey that have been killed to abortion. So it's just, it's just to get the, you know, the, 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 the vastness of this, of how big this issue is, and are we, are we giving it the attention it deserves when it's, when it's such a vast issue? And, you know, I'm not here to just say how bad this is and then say, bye, go home, and then go home. Look, we, we have worked, we have studied into the history of social reform to see how, what principles can we learn um, in terms of ending injustice. And what we've learned is you, you need to make injustice the issue. They're making rights the issue. They're making it about um, reproductive health. But we need to show that this is an injustice issue. First and foremost, we need to prove the humanity of the, um, of the victim. And we need to um, prove the inhumanity of the injustice. So let's take, for example, the transatlantic slave trade. They had to first, you know, the, this was happening out of sight, out of mind to the people in the UK. All they saw of the slave trade was the benefits, you know, the, the rum, the sugar, the, the benefits of the slave trade. They didn't see the suffering. It was out of sight, out of mind here in this nation. And so what the abolitionists had to do is they had to use images such as this to show the humanity of the black African. And then they had to show, they used images such as this to show the suffering what was going on. There was all sorts of euphemisms back then, like these savage Africans were being taken and given a better life over in the British West Indies. And the people believed that until the abolitionists started showing what was really happening. And that is our role as well for our unborn brothers and sisters. This image, I don't know if anyone's ever seen this image before, but it may not look very um, controversial to us, but at the time, the, the industry, the slave industry hated this image. And they hated the fact that Thomas Clarkson went, went around on horseback all over the nation and he pinned it up to trees, he pinned it up in community halls because it exposed what it's, it is, is it? it's the Brooks ship, it's a slave ship and if you look close up, sorry you probably can't see very well, but it shows how the slaves are stacked like sardines from all the different angles, like, like treated like cargo and um, this what caused a lot of outrage and exposed a bit of the, of the, the um, transatlantic slave trade and exposed it and the people of England started to become outraged more and more. They showed the shackles and things like that. They had to show the suffering because it was out of sight, out of mind. And William Wilberforce, we all know his name, but he'd been in talks in government for decades and nothing was changing. It was only when Thomas Clarkson, and the other abolitionists came on board and really began to dramatize and expose the injustice and show the humanity and show the inhumanity of the... This image, you may have seen this, so America was very um, in favor of the Vietnam War Two images like this came out and it turned people against, the, or the public against the Vietnam War. And Dr. Martin Luther King, you may or may not know this quote, like a boil that can never be cured so long as it is covered up, but must be opened with all its ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light. Injustice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. Um, and he knew, he, he knew when he was going on his marches, he made sure he invited the reporters because he knew that they were going to set the dogs on them. He knew they were going to set the, um, the water cannons on them. And he wanted the reporters to be there to take the photo because he wanted to shame America before the world at how it was treating its um, peaceful citizen, black citizens. So it was very strategic. And if um, there was a letter from Mar um, Alabama jail, I don't know if anyone's read that, that he wrote. And there was some white, they called, he calls them the white moderates, who were saying, yes, we agree with you in your goals. We agree, like, we, we want to end segregation, but we don't agree with you in your methods. And they were telling him to slow down, like, stop causing a scene. They were telling him to just wait. Things will change. But Martin Luther King knew. He'd studied the history of social reform. He knew that the trajectory of, of human nature is not to just naturally get better. You know, it takes men and women to, to stand up and expose what's going on. 
And so we need to do the same. We, I, just, I bring that up because we get the same from some churches. You know, oh, you're causing a scene. Oh, you can't show the images. Oh, you can't. And it's like, well, you know, what's important? That we stand up for the vulnerable or that we're people like us? And I think we all know what Jesus modeled. Likewise, I'm going to breeze through some of these now. If you wanted to show the, the Holocaust, would we show this image? Much of the humanity, but this image, I couldn't, we couldn't begin to describe it. It paints a thousand words. And we all know that this image changed, you know, this more recent one of the, of the four-year-old um, Syrian boy who was swept up. And before this image, David Cameron has said, we're not bringing any more refugees into this nation. He changed his policy overnight. Why? A picture of a dead child. Images are powerful. Images change public opinion. Public opinion changes policy. The government knows it. It uses graphic images like this to, um, to inform and educate on the dangers of drink driving. And lastly, would Jesus use bloody images to make his point? He already did. He chose the busiest day of the Jewish calendar. Families would have been out for a public, gruesome, brutal crucifixion. And um, that was his method of salvation for us all. So to summarize, what we've learned is we cannot change public policy until we change public opinion. And that's what we're doing. Um, and no social reformer has ever ended in injustice by covering it up. It's just not possible. And the change seldom occurs unless the cost of maintaining the status quo becomes unbearable. It's not a happy message I'm bringing today. I know that. It's not, you guys aren't going to be like, yeah, yeah. But this is reality and people need, people need it to be unbearable for people to be bothered to move because we can so easily walk by on the other side and leave that beat up, man. Um, so how can we apply these today? So our organisation, Centre for Bioethical Reform UK, we are, our goal is to educate society on the humanity of the unborn child and the reality of abortion. Simple. We're, education, we're educating, we're exposing um, the humanity and the reality of abortion. And um, so these are some of our, our projects. Brephos actually is specific ministry to the church. Brephos is the Greek word, which is the same word used in the Bible to um, describe both Jesus as the unborn child and when um, the baby was born as well. So it's like a continuum. So it shows, you know, there's no difference, magic difference when the child comes out the birth canal. Um, Brephos was the same word used for the infant. And... Um, so, yeah, as I said, we're showing the humanity of the child and the reality of abortion. And if we could go, into, go onto the TV and show this to everyone, we would. But as you can imagine, they're very pro-choice, very pro-abortion. The media is. We don't get that many um, opportunities to actually show where we get to go. We're able to use our words. But when people see the images, you know, I've seen people change their mind just like that. Not everyone changes like that. Some people take a while. Other people are hardened, and you know we don't know what happens. It's a seed planted, just like the gospel, right? But um, we know that we, we need to get these to the people. So what we found is that we take banners. We take big banners. We go out into the city center we, um, because that's where we can meet the most people. We go outside abortion clinics. We tend to have smaller banners there and um, offers for help as well because that's where the front lines, where the killing is happening. And we go outside Parliament because these are the decision makers. So these these different areas is we're, we're just bringing, we're just bringing the, the, this victim before the people and um, exposing what's what's really happening. And we're seeing people's minds change all the time. And this this is one outside the the Department of Health. So you can see we don't we don't protest abortion. We're not there saying you won't see in any of our literature saying stop abortion. Abortion is wrong. We simply present people with the facts, allowing them to come to their own conclusions. And most